Hello, everybody, and welcome to whatever this thing is. This is going to be a quick discussion. Not even quick. It's going to be a discussion between uh, myself and my co-host about queer media and its impact during our young queer lives. My name's David. And I'm Robert Mackay. And today we're going to be talking about... Oh gosh, we're going to talk about Game Informer, we're going to talk about Sonic the Hedgehog, we're going to talk about Dragon Ball Z, and we're going to talk about dress-up dolls and adult content on Newgrounds.com. What else? Amazing. Yeah, so some of the things that I wanted to bring to the topics today uh, in the world of print would be comics. X-Men comics specifically for me, but I'm going to talk about any comics. I feel that comics and superheroes, supervillains are a big thing for me. Uh, On the topic of TV and film was Queer as Folk as a TV series was uh, definitely a thing that I uh, watched a lot as a budding gay youth. And then in video games, it would be RPGs. That's where I spent a lot of my time. And then also fighter games, too, because they were really popular and I had like an interesting relationship to them. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. So like, should we talk about our background at all? Like what we do or should we just get into it? (laughs) It's up to you. Yeah, I'm I'm down either way. Um, Okay, cool. Well, Robert and I met through improv comedy. We do a lot of stage or did a lot of stage performance together before, you know, the great happening of 2020. Uh, And now, you know, we are just sort of catching up, doing something slightly creative and recording this conversation. Is there Mm -hmm. anything else you wanted to add, Robert? No, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I'm just glad that I'm doing this. I have such happy, exciting, and uh, playful memories associated to Mr. David Borja um, because we met in a place that was centered around... Don't use around... my last name! Oh, <laughs> no! Am I not supposed to? <laughs> I'm being identified! I'll bleep it out. <laughs> really? It's fine. No, 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 it's I fine. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm still bleeping it out, though. <laughs> okay, I'll, be, I'll just be like, David, David Blank. <laughs> it's almost like David Blaine, but not, you're not yeah. a wizard uh, yeah. or magician. Um, but we, we met in a queer space, right? And it was focused on queer yeah. and performance and that, which was really cool. I mean, community is really big to me. And we did a lot of different type of performance together. Like we were in a comedy troupe that we formed at one point. It was like short lived, mm-hmm. right? And we did videos, we did stage, we did audio stuff. We did um, just scripts, writing scripts and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was just a lot of like creative exploration that I did. And fortunately, much of it was on queer stuff. So when you approach me about this topic, I was like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So can we talk about some print media? Can we talk about how it molded our brains and shaped our our membrane folds? What are the little, (laughs) what are the little like, (laughs) the the, the things that, that yeah, they looked like, I don't know, they're little, the waves of the brain, the little folds. Um, I, I love that you're looking up cranial folds because... Neural ugh, fold! That's what I wanted. You were halfway there. <laughs> I didn't even know they had a thing. I just always thought of it as that, like, weird brain formation, you know? It kind of looked like a dried up prune. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I'm uh, happy to start by talking about Game Informer. Please um, do, and I'm so glad we're looking at images for this because I was not... Sh- I'm pretty positive. Yes, okay, mm-hmm. these are them. Yeah. These very much, and there were other ones, right? Like Gay Informer was one, but there was definitely ones that Did came you say discs. Gay Informer? Hey, aww. I might have. <laughs> it's it's my lisp slash my undertone of what I want this to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they came with those discs, right? They came, like, many of them came yeah. with discs, and they had, like, demos of games you could try. Yeah, that's what you were telling me. I was like, I, yeah, because when I got them, I did not get these uh, discs. I, they must have, like, discontinued them. Um, ah. Because, uh, yeah, I must have started reading it in 06 or 07. It was at yeah. the dawn of the Wii, like, right before the Nintendo Wii began. Um, mm. Because before the Nintendo Wii was launched, it was going to be the Nintendo Revolution, I think they called it. That was, like, really? the code name. Yeah, which was a way better name. Can you imagine going from the N60... Uh, sorry, from the Nintendo GameCube to the Nintendo Revolution? <laughs> It, you know what? It totally would have been like the Nintendo Rev. Everyone would have like abbreviated it. Yeah. It would have become like the, you're getting the N Rev. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I think it would have, I think it would have been nice, but instead it became the Wii, uh, but it didn't deter them. It became like the second best selling video game console of all time. And it like started this whole 
weird thing about um, motion control games. So anyway, so I was looking at Game Informer and I was looking, just sort of like flipping through. Let's see if we can pull up like a 2006 cover. Okay. While you pull that out. Yeah. So I, I now realize, I think... I think you were on the cusp of why you only saw so many of these with discs because there was other competing magazines that were like this. And yes. Because I am, you know, a little bit older than you. Um, <laughs> th there was years that I had where I was reading these and there was it was like a guarantee. Every time you bought it, you pretty much bought it for the disc was because yeah. you got a demo of the latest game that was coming out. And it was always something you threw into your PC when a PC still had, you know, like a disc drive. Yeah, and you would get that demo, and you could try things out. So it was very much a way of exposing myself to new games. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was definitely eye-opening for games because it wasn't like they tried to be as equal opportunity as possible. They tried to ha have games from Xbox, PC, PlayStation, and Nintendo. So mm -hmm. you know the big ones, and even like handheld games as well, because those started mm -hmm. cropping up a lot more. Um, no, they'd been a thing since, like, the Game Boy, but the Nintendo DS was also super popular. Anyway, mm -hmm. the Nintendo DS and the PSP, by the way, this is mm -hmm. definitely showing some of my gamer love, um, is, like, that was sort of, like, the last great, like, handheld rivalry, because after that, they tried yeah. to have the PlayStation Vita, which was after the PSP, um, did not do very well. The Nintendo 3DS did well, and then there was just mobile gaming like on yeah. people's phones and that's yeah. like the new market like just the biggest market yeah. so anyway enough of these tidbits why did game and queer angle leave an impression on me well so this is a bit of a running theme in some of my like young sexuality is like i was definitely questioning for a super long time and mm -hmm. um i didn't want it's not even that i didn't like want to like shun my gayness or whatever i genuinely like felt you know i would get uh we're gonna be explicit in this i'm deciding now <laughs> i do would it. get do it <laughs> i would get, get little boners when i was looking at um pictures <laughs> of like scantily clad women and this will come in more into mm. play as i bring up more of my examples and in game informer they had this weird i wish i remember what the brand was because I just don't, I don't even know what they were for. They must have been an advertisement for mobile phone wallpapers. And I think the idea was you could text this number and it would give you, you would get some sort of small charge for your texting, um, maybe like a dollar or like 50 cents or something like that. Yeah. And then it would send you an image of whatever uh, like image code you sent to this oh. service. Um, and so... Uh, all they had was just this giant grid of these like wallpapers and most of them were just like really kind of lame like clip art looking things or just like graphic design looking things like graffiti tags yeah just like like late grunge just like kind of identityless early aughts design you know oh, wow <laughs> um yes. and one of the designs that they had was like um it was like a lady in uh in like skin tight jeans but she was like sort of like pulling down her jeans in the front and mm. there was something about it that just did you really see the activated. undies did you see the like thong front Ma yeah almost definitely okay. classic uh, classic you did yeah. see that and there was just there was just something about that that really just like activated me and then the mm. other little thing that i saw in a game informer magazine was an axe body spray ad now, do you can you recall oh. any Axe body spray ads? It's from, funny like, the I, mid aughts. Well, um, I remember the commercials. I remember right? print ads that were like in public places, but I wasn't really reading these magazines at that time, so I wasn't seeing probably what you were seeing in Game Informer. But yeah, fuck if it's anything like the, you know, the, oh Jesus, the Axe body spray ads like this. I remember this. It was so heteronormative. <laughs> it yeah. Was so like. Yeah. Oh, and just so, so like brutal. male dominated. Uh, oh God, I can't. I can't. <laughs> it's too much. Um, so in the ad in print in Game Informer, the axe ad was this very like well drawn, like chiseled 
guy with like really like big nipples i feel like like really like prominent nipples Mm -hmm. um you know six high beams brought full power just super toned and uh yeah and tan and it was just like x body spray be a fucking man about it or whatever (laughs) their slogan was was about to be their slogan (laughs) be a man about it and it has to sound like a smoking old librarian (laughs) (laughs) yeah um and uh yeah i remember looking at that a bunch as well and it was less of that like visceral reaction and more of like just like very curious like i just looked at it a bunch of times of just like Mm. what what is this yeah yeah Yeah. how about that's interesting and that would totally throw into the whole factor of questioning right so you're having a reaction to the female figure and to the male figure yeah and i mean i I'm sure I must have had stuff like this, but I mean, like, and it, to me, it wasn't even Game Informer because I was, I guess, Game Informer and things like that were such a nerd factor for me. I went straight into the game stuff. Yeah. I wasn't even looking at that. To me, it was like looking at other kind of magazines like um, department store catalogs and that. And I would, you know, it's a classic. You go into the underwear section because you're looking. Now there's men's and women's underwear, but I was like, I knew I was getting stimulated by this looking at this and perceiving this and having an opportunity to peer into the less clothed but i wasn't positive of what exactly what i was getting stimulated by right so that would have been like my equivalent of the questioning period where you're like because i at an early age i was fortunate enough to have very progressive family upbringing and and you know parents that were, that were like i was lucky in that regard that i wasn't afraid of being attracted to both sexes um uh well masculine and feminine um uh, gender identities i should say but uh, to those two ends of the spectrum, but um, I so but I just didn't know what it was that was stimulating when I would we, would I would witness these things right when I would go mm-hmm. to those magazines I was like I just like being titillated <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, yeah um, totally so it's it's confusing it's so confusing just being a young person and like this is so much of the story that I'm working on is about of just like trying as best as you can to like tell people you're into them and hoping that you don't offend them (laughs) you know yeah yeah Yeah. and well this is so funny because like david and i were talking earlier today about relationship based Mm -hmm. stuff and how Mm -hmm. a big part of the discovery is because you can you can reflect on it you can analyze it you can think about it especially after the fact or even before you go into that date or something but some of it comes from just experiencing it and i feel like probably stuff like this game informer stuff is those steps before the experiencing right where you're like you're researching and you're looking and you're being titillated you're being excited by but you don't know what specifically because you're not experiencing it yet you're just not searching yeah yeah you're just having your neural folds shaped by media <laughs> i'm so glad we learned that word today can we have you a word of the play. day every time we get together <laughs> for sure neural i folds. love a word of the day mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. what was your experience with uh print shit well, it's so interesting because right now, for those listening, we're looking at a Game Informer with a cover of Resident Evil, mm-hmm. for to be precise. And I think, for me, it was less specific to the Game Informers, but I wouldn't be surprised if going through them, I was experiencing much of the same stuff that I found in other print media, such as like mm-hmm. comics and that, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. I found in the video game world in general. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a crossover, wherein like seeing the characters from games like resident evil or mm-hmm. from uh rpgs or the devil may cry guy like i was just gonna him. say does this guy do anything for you oh he does a thing for me <laughs> it, there there is a um it video game characters like superheroes and comic book people are caricaturized they're enhanced yeah. and there are um glamorized so you get to it's almost like seeing the model but it's a more creative version of a model because somebody has put in their you know a pen to paper or a digital pen to screen and has designed this thing that's like they got bigger muscles they've got more defined eyes they've got these like these qualities that you already were sort of like ooh, i saw that person in the street and i like their eyes now i'm seeing them in action and hyper you know like uh extended compared to what you would get in person and yeah, so totally. there's always all sorts of like stimulation. So like, I remember like, you know, the devil may cry, um, guy definitely as like, he's super handsome. I remember Dante. the Dante 
uh, and then um, Castlevania, like um, Belmont. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the Belmont guy. Um, those yeah, those so characters. Yeah, Simon Belmont and there's Richter Belmont. Yeah. Um, and they look slightly different. But so, they're both, like, attractive. Yeah, and once again... is the pretty boy, I believe. Yes. And generally either, like... It was one of two things. Either scantily clad and muscle-bound or oh, stylish. And so yeah. that was, like, my mashup. Like, I love style. I love fashion. I've got way more, more scarves than anyone should ever own. Mm-hmm. And so I loved those two characters. And I loved the mashup of they kind of represented things I wanted to be and things I was attracted to. Uh, mm-hmm. So I would see that in Game Informer, and I'd always be like, I'm like, I love this game, but it was more than this game. You love the characters, you love the look mm-hmm. of them, and you love the ability to embody that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said about, like, media has this weird aspect of, like, there's, sometimes you want to feel like you can relate to the people you're watching or the characters you're watching or playing or whatever and sometimes you just want to feel like you can aspire to them um and that's why that's maybe one of the more interesting things about the superhero genre is because like you hope that it is about winning and you hope it is a bit of a i don't even know if power fantasy is the right word but just like yeah just watching someone do something superhuman and look superhuman yeah (laughs) um And there is this sort of like unattainability aspect that kind of drives the like attraction and the excitement of just like, oh, is is there anybody as beautiful as Henry Cavill or whatever? Oh, God. (laughs) And that's the celebrityism. And the celebrityism Mm -hmm. is like there's a version of that in media, right? When you look at these magazines and we go into those video games, um, they become celebrities unto themselves because they become so well known. Um, But unlike Henry Cavill, Mm -hmm. I can play Richter Belmont. I can mm-hmm. play, um, you know, these these other leads. And yeah. so there's kind of an extra tangibility to it that you don't get uh, from just a mm-hmm. standard real life celebrity. Um, yeah. Plus they're just, they're glamorized differently. You know, there's like, you'll never see, Henry Cavill will never have like proportions like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know if anybody does. He's like yeah. 10 heads tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like 90% leg. <laughs> There's a yeah. little bit of torso and in a beautiful head. <laughs> you know, like it's so, like it's, and and I think it also, I bet you would find a consistency with a lot of the geeks that fall for this are probably also very artistic geeks. Hmm. You know, there's probably like a, a trend of that, like the artsy drawing design graphic design types and that are the ones who also fall for this stuff because they love the creative element that's added on top of the uh, caricature and the enhanced version of a human form Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i totally get that so more specifically with like print media we can circle back to uh some of the video games you were thinking of if they come up but yeah what were you reading what were you flipping through page wise in terms of like like gaming magazines or the like the the print stuff that uh, I was going print stuff in. in general yeah in general so i mean my out. thing was definitely comics uh yeah that and it's so funny i was thinking about this a bit when you were when we were talking earlier about how i you know going through those comics i feel like i was almost experiencing the baseline of it right i was Ooh, like what do you mean so the baseline of the experience versus the meta or in mm-hmm. the underlying, right? Whatever metaphor you want to use. But mm-hmm. basically, like, the main part of it. Like, I went because they're cool art. It's fun and fantastical. And they're, like, mutants. And they have powers. And they're cool, right? Like, you just kind of had that cool. Like, you went, you got mm-hmm. a comic. You followed the narrative. And you got into the characters. That's the baseline for me. That's what I was experiencing. That was primarily what I was going for. But that whole time it was occurring, I was getting stimulated by, titillated by, intrigued by and experiencing under the surface this idea of like oh actually i really like that these guys are built Mm -hmm. i like that these guys are weirdos and outcasts who are fighting for who they are but i don't know why (laughs) because Mm -hmm. so much of my life at that point was confusing and let alone my sexuality because i didn't really Mm -hmm. pursue my sexuality very much till university like Mm -hmm. the people who pursued me did just that they pursued me as opposed to i went out and hunted for people it was always somebody who would date me ask me out and that like i was just Mm -hmm. like always like the dorky nerdy alternative type 
Oh, fuck. <laughs> no. I, there's nothing to brag about. because uh, like, People just surround me with love. <laughs> <laughs> they threw themselves at me. I constantly got concussions because I had a body being thrown at me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just... So I guess that was maybe a kind of outlet for me. It's like because I had mm. fear around experiencing it with people, I could experience mm-hmm. it through print and video games and mm-hmm. movies and television. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me... Th- think of something i'm just gonna put it to you and see what you think is like there's this aspect and a bit of a theme in what we're talking about i mean we'll get to queer as folk in a little bit but in the stuff that i'm certainly bringing to the table there's no like overt queer content to any of this it was just stuff that i looked at that cemented itself as like an image in my brain that was really potent and then um all of the sort of learning or unlearning uh, having to do with like queer relationship and like my personal identity and you know just like being my own person and not you know looking at sonic the hedgehog or whatever and being like what life lessons can i fucking extract from this <laughs> Take from blue, sonic this if blue i collect rat. a thousand rings <laughs> <laughs> um and you said before there was a like like a there's this undercurrent of like gay awakening when you look at yeah. well-built superhero men and in my mind i almost think of it as more of like a like a superficial like overcurrent cuz you're reading these stories about mm-hmm. um you know they're like solving disasters they're becoming closer as friends they're like learning things about themselves but like i was saying there's no like queer or gay content um actually like within the story as far as i know uh, yeah. so it's just this thing of like, I really like looking at these people and mm-hmm. it's just like such a, it's just such a thing. And like, you just don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I love that you said that. That is so great because it's funny. I was just struggling with the understanding of the metaphor that I was developing out. But I was like, there's like an upper layer and a lower layer. And then I'm <laughs> in the mid layer and, and, but I couldn't articulate it. And I, you just completed my puzzle. So thank you for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, this is exactly what I see. So there, I was experiencing the middle layer. Imagine like a nice little sandwich we're having here. And yeah. the middle layer is what we're experiencing. The meat it's of the, the meat. <laughs> the meat. Oh, God, it's so gay relevant. Um, <laughs> the meat is what we were experiencing. And funny enough, later in life, we experienced lots more. Uh, <laughs> but um, that was the heart of it, right? That's the middle layer that we're experiencing. Yeah, the just the story. Layer, what everyone story. else is also getting invested in. And, and I want to take it abstract a little bit from the story because to me it's like yes reading the reading the story seeing reading the dialogue seeing the characters seeing the blow shit up sure Mm -hmm. but then there's a layer above the layer above was the meta stuff that i was aware of at that age that i was you know like not super invested in because i wasn't educated enough and i wasn't mature enough but i knew that like okay the x-men are fighting because they're different I didn't mm-hmm. know, really know what that meant. I didn't know that that was a struggle that people universally uh, had and that this was something that all face later in life. Like that was the mm-hmm. the upper layer, the bread in this in this sandwich. Yeah. Um, but then I was like, but then there's also my relationship to it. And I think that's the lower layer, layer of bread. So you got <laughs> yeah. the, the meta of the story, the heart yeah. of the story, and then the lower layer of bread to me is mm-hmm. our story of it. So mm-hmm. I was experiencing, and I think you were experiencing, the the titillation and the stimulation and what does this mean to me and why do i like this and i'm I'm confused mm-hmm. and my hormones are fucking firing three different ways you know like that stuff doesn't cement until way later but we're yeah. experiencing all three of those layers as we're going through that i think yeah yeah i think so and it is funny too the like especially in like these times where there are different layers of technology that sort of separate people and uh just what i'm getting at is like the different order that sometimes people figure out that they're interested in interested in someone you know Mm. um and when you think about like your relationship to like x-men for example it's like you know it's hard to say like what came first or whatever like it all just sort of came at you and then over time you sort of like processed this larger experience and the layers that you're talking about um and a lot of times it's like that when you're meeting people where it's like uh when you like meet someone like in a gay relationship or when you're single and gay (laughs) um (laughs) and like 
do you approach them like because you're attracted to them do you approach them because you've known each other for a while and like you you click regarding some like shared interest uh or like is it like completely out of the blue you have no idea like but you just like there's like something in the air there's like something about this person um and <laughs> it's a song from the white king <laughs> there's something, something in the air, air. there's Tonight. something about this person <laughs> That was both yeah, horribly it's, it's sung by both of us. <laughs> um, and I don't know. My whole point with that is, like, at the end of the day, we develop a relationship with media, whether we like it or not, just like oh, yeah. we develop a relationship with people. And yeah. what's interesting is, like, how much do you take, like, from that relationship with media? Do you try to, like, you know... Is it like aspirational? Is it you're trying mm. to relate to these people? Is it you're just trying to like see a totally different perspective? You know, yeah. that's I, what that I makes th me think of. <laughs> For sure. And I think there's two major factors I think about with this. One is that I think we're too, especially at that age group, right? Like most of what I was going through was the 90s, yours more of the 2000s, that kind yeah. of those teen years going into college. I think that um there's too much other shit going on in your life uh and in yeah. your physical body to be, almost be able to dive deep enough on it in addition you yeah. don't have the education the second part to it i think is that we during those periods weren't exposed like you had mentioned this how like that content was not explicitly queer it was yeah. not like gay wolverine going on his gay adventure it was just <laughs> yeah. wolverine fighting some you know sentinels or yeah. you know in like game informer of those like these scantily clad you know wallpaper ads weren't for gay wallpaper so mm -hmm. that we're experiencing mainstream north american content in the 90s and the 2000s and it wasn't until more recently that i think that second layer started becoming the like the content is going to as is now changing like i literally remember within the last five years or something seeing how like it was like an announcement that like marvel's like we're gonna make uh iceman gay i think it was or something or some derivative of him and yeah. or, and um oh, one of my favorites uh um mm, shatterstar shatterstar is uh, mm. a gay man and he's like from an alien world and stuff so that's an announcement and in the last five years we're well past our age then so i think it's good that that content's changed and now it's going to be a bit more specific however i still think humans haven't changed and aren't going to change we're in like the the teens experiencing that it's great that they're going to exposed to it so they're going to like talk about it learn about it and be exposed to it earlier and they're going to develop faster as a result but i think mm -hmm. they're still going to be dealing with the same problems they're still going to be confused oh, yeah. about their bodies confused about what's going on in life worried about the course they you know they take whether or not they're going to pass chemistry 12. Mm -hmm. you know like that's the stuff that's primarily bothering them so until they experience it and they go through it rather than just kind of like doing the research phase mm -hmm. they're not going to make those realizations yeah yeah i think so it's it's so funny there's almost like there's almost nothing funnier to me than like overhearing like teenagers and like preteens having like those like deep conversations where they're like just figuring things out um and they're like oh you know like my relationship with my boyfriend is just so like it's so complicated um and it's like really he didn't text me back in an hour yeah. i always reply in five minutes <laughs> yeah and like not to take anything away from those relationships but it's just interesting like this is sort of a mantra that i've been thinking through a lot lately is um the only way out is through um and it's just this sort of uh thing that i remind myself of like you know whenever i'm going through a difficult experience or a difficult conversation or trying to solve like a difficult like problem with my work or whatever um i have to like remind myself like well the only way out is through like i'm not gonna just like bail and like quit on the problem uh there's no way to really like learn from this except by doing it which is exactly what you're saying yeah. the you know yeah. have the experience whatever that means <laughs> and that's massive and the only reason you can say that because you're at your age and you've been through whereas a lot of those equivalent teens of us now yeah. at the age we were haven't been through 
And mm-hmm. so it's great that they're going to expose to it. I think they'll go through it earlier and they'll be talking about more taboo stuff that was taboo for us and is less so now yeah. earlier. But they're still not, they still have to go through. Like, like you say, like it's totally per, um, uh, uh, relevant when they're having those conversations. Like, Johnny didn't reply to me within the hour and that means he hates me and we're breaking up. You know, it's like, yeah. it sounds petty, but it's real for them because it's real at that point in their life because they haven't been through. Mm-hmm. We've been through that. Mm-hmm. And that is always going to be the same issue with everyone because when you start out in the game of life, your little pig piece is at the beginning. <laughs> We're just par- further down the board, right? Mm-hmm. So those all those people have to go through. Now, there's something I want you to look up because mm-hmm. you shared with me something from your content. Look mm-hmm. up the Marvel Swimsuit Edition. Oh, so hell yeah. We all went... <laughs> As we were saying, going through these moments kind of in a meta way or subconsciously. But there are certain things I think we all did to really... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, David. There's definitely some stuff that we did consciously. And this was one for me. My brother owned, I think, two or three of these. And I constantly stole it from him. And I was... It was like... This was actionable gay stuff. <laughs> I was oh, like, yeah. I wanted to see Wolverine in a swimsuit. I wanted to see Cyclops oh, spinning that God. volleyball in his finger. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this amazing? That's and it so was, good. This was, and it was, it was their sports illustrated or whatever, you know, like the sports. It was all the like famous, whatever, sports people, but we're yeah, yeah. swimsuits. And <laughs> it was Marvel's own version of it. So this was like hypersexualized to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I remember no going kidding. to these. I remember looking at these up, and like this is like one of the probably like a center spread or whatever, almost like yeah. you were looking at a porn mag. But I mean, there was ones where they truly, focused on truly like her nipple is like right at the edge of that tank top. <laughs> Go over like, to Psylocke. Sc- scroll happen. to the right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was lying down in the foreground. Oh, Psylocke, he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. If you uh, maybe. You can sort of tell that her, on her left boob, it looks like the mm-hmm. shadows are done such that her nipple must be so prominent that it actually removes on, on the left boob, and mm. then it removes the shadow, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> there, yeah. there's no shading around where <sighs> her nipple is because they're prominent enough that it, <laughs> it, it eliminates shadow. Uh, wish you were here. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's and so fun. It was just, this was gay awakening stuff for me. This is, and this yeah. was like conscious. Yeah, no kidding. For sure. This, Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, we can unpack this more if you want, but this actually reminds me of some of the more conscious gay awakening that I had in TV and film. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 please. I I would love to talk TV film. Yeah, I mean, well, the piece that I was going to talk about was around Queer as Folk. So I don't know if you ever watched that series. Never in my goddamn life. Wow, you Tell me are everything. missing out. However, it is probably one of those things that if I watched now as an adult, I'd be like, wow, well, this is dated. <laughs> and yeah. I've actually talked to friends who have said that. But mm-hmm. at the time, it was relevant to me. Uh, there is This is the American one we're looking at. There is mm-hmm. a British version as well. Okay, which one this, did you watch I, more? The American one. I didn't even know about okay. the British one until I was done the series. Okay. But uh, I had a thing for the lead who was uh-huh. like the tall, dark, and handsome ones. He's the one in the leather jacket. He was like very much bad this boy. And he was the one everybody wanted. And uh-huh. he, of course, picked up and, and picked up the Twinkie blonde. And mm-hmm. that was his queer awakening. Mm-hmm. But it was him. And then the one he's holding the hand up was the unrequited loved one. And he was the big nerd. So okay. he was also kind of dark and cute. And he was a nerd and he was awkward. What does dark mean, by the way? Dark to me, uh, like it's, I know it's kind of comes from the term tall, dark, and handsome, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I like dark features in the sense of like, I like dark eyes. Um, I like dark hair color. I like Uh... um, darker skin tones. Like I have a general thing for more ethnic guys, like overall. Um, But I have no racial preference. Uh, It's just like, if you have darker features, it's usually, I'm going to notice you more on first glance. Um, So he definitely fell into that category for me so it was sort of the lead and then hit and he actually he i think had a relationship with the lead at one point i can't remember mm. but um and he ran a comic book shop believe it or not oh, okay in real life yeah the nerd uh, no well the character and, oh okay okay uh, yeah yeah and um 
so yeah they were kind of like the two that i really like thought was super cute and i was super into and mm-hmm. my thing was is that as a young budding gay who was also mm-hmm. a nerdy tech type i was the only person in the household who knew how to operate the vcr yes we had a vcr because yeah. i'm older than you so it wasn't dvd <laughs> i've had vcrs as well <laughs> okay good vcr mm-hmm. and it's classic nobody knows how to program the vcr it is very true they were horrendous mm-hmm. but i knew how to do it and I figured out how to record this. So this was the kind of show that was on oh, Showcase, I think, HBO. One of those kind of like risque adult channels. And But it was only shown at like, I think like 11 at night or something, which was generally past my birthday, unless nobody was a birthday, past my bedtime, unless nobody was around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could only watch one show after every birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, my birthday treat to myself. I get to yeah. watch TV. <laughs> My own, one and only show for the year. <laughs> um, but so what I'd do is I'd set up the VCR to record and it would record it during the night. And then when nobody was home, I would watch this. So this was straight up, whereas so much of my stuff was just like exploring without realizing as exploring queer content. This yeah. was an explicit choice. I was like, I was like, I was like, I want to watch this. I want to be educated on like queer people. And um, but really, I was just full on as like just closeted and, and not yet experiencing dating men totally uh, and it was very cool so i don't know did you have a show like that or anything that was yeah kind of like a hidden secret literally as you were saying that i realized the um british version of skins uh season one Even the name sounds good <laughs> yeah uh skins season one cast is this them uh there's a lot of them yeah, very yeah, white. I think this is <laughs> yes, yeah, super white. <laughs> yeah. Wow, um, I think. Yeah, and this was around the beginning of when I was in college. I think I started yeah. watching this. Yeah, and there is a bit of a love scene between this uh, blonde guy and this dark-haired guy. I was um, just gonna put put those two together. And, That's what I thought. Oh wow, yeah. um, and. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It just, I, for whatever reason, I didn't remember it until just now, like, as you were talking about Queer as Folk, of, like, you know, I didn't realize I was, um, yeah, like, exploring in my own way, like, while watching that. But, yeah, upon reflection, I was just like, nah, like, this is definitely something uh, that I would want, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or this is, like, yeah, or it was, and it's so funny because I think it is, this is where I can't, I can't compare. Like, I would love to talk to a youth of today and mm-hmm. see, like, their willingness to explore this because they're exposed to it more than mm-hmm. I was back in my day. Because yeah. I think, regardless of whether or not I was exposed to more of this content, I still probably wouldn't have explored as much because I was an awkward nerdy like didn't think i was attractive didn't think i had any merit and so that hence why like yeah the people i dated came to me i never really pursued anyone and i was always like i was one of those people who like people would hit on me and my, my friends would have to tell me after the fact they're like robert that guy or that girl is hitting on you and i'm like what mm-hmm. no she mm-hmm. just wanted my sandwich mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. everyone wanted my sandwich mm-hmm. um that's so it's it's interesting i'm like i just I think for me, I probably wouldn't have pursued it much more than through the ability to experience in media. Mm-hmm. But maybe a modern kid who is exposed to this, who's also willing to act on their hormones would. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking of right now is like the uh, the YouTube channel that I watched that was really formative. Uh, I think his Bring name was was Tracy Shaw. Um, and he identified as a bisexual kid, um, oh. and his whole thing was, like, just doing little, like, Q&A type videos, um, and just sort of, like, yeah, oh God, just, like, so cute. answering people's questions about, like, whether they might be bi or they might be gay or whatever, um, and it was really helpful. The Honestly, the only thing that I can remember that he talked about was like when people ask like when should i come out to my family and friends and Mm. he actually made a really like great point he just said like listen unless you're like dating someone or you are you know 
like you're in some sort of situation where it's like super obvious, so to speak, um, no one really needs to know. And if you feel like only if you feel like 100% secure or there's like some sort of hint that you've gotten from family and friends that like they would accept you no matter what, um, they really don't need to know. So you shouldn't have to pressure yourself to come out. Um, And so stuff like that. And then I don't know. It was weird. That's I definitely really, had a really, crush on him. <laughs> uh, I can I can see why he he <laughs> falls into the category of like dark feature, super cute yeah. and boyish. Like I could see him being your type. Uh, yeah. He he totally reminds me of like the age of like late nineties, early two thousands, like emo band types that I exactly. like, totally had a thing for. It was um, it was such a thing in the mid. Such aughts. a thing, and. It's interesting. I think he makes a good point of like what I what I would translate that as, what I would take my advice from that as is like unless you're hiding it to an extent where it's hurting you or you're preventing like revealing a part of your life that you want to share with your friends or family. Yeah. Um that's one reason to come out. And then the alternative is I think for me it's around the fact that like you need to like coming out unfortunately it still runs a risk factor of it impacting your life like exactly you know financially emotionally spiritually in terms of like having a home and so i don't think a lot of people appreciate that or understand that like depending on your circumstances it's a self-preservation piece yeah so if you're not gonna yeah like if you can't really protect yourself or like if you're concerned about your protection then sometimes you maybe don't need to say it until yeah. you're in a position to, that you can do it and like i chose to do that and it wasn't it wasn't a factor for me it came it's when i realized it then i did it but i just happened to be in a point in my life where i was pretty much already independent so i didn't really give a shit what would happen yeah it was the but same for me definitely kids out there who would face that because it's not the same as like being kind of a, just a heteronormative straight kid and you know having to come out and being like mom dad yeah i've got a girlfriend yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'd just be like yeah i yeah, expect yeah, yeah. you to sooner or later you know <laughs> the risk for them is being like i had sex with her then they're like yeah you, you know you're in shit yeah yeah and this is like maybe outside the scope of i didn't check the clock when we started by the way do you do you know how long we've been going i mean since my recording started I, it's been 49 minutes okay great um then we're doing great this reminds me of this sort of other problem with like yeah just like queer youth and figuring those things out is like so much of like so much of coming out is literally like admitting your sexuality and like sexuality is like such a more complicated thing than just like who you're attracted to and you have no idea like what that ends up looking like until you are actually sexually active um And then even once you start doing that, um, you know, you can't really like, especially if you're like a late teen, like teenager, it, I would be super surprised if you're comfortable, like talking to your family about that stuff. So you end up like talking to friends about it or like just trying to find articles and just like reading random things. Like certainly now, like with the internet, I think it's a little easier for people to find information like yeah like in my case like i just found a random youtuber who i was like this guy seems trustworthy and hot <laughs> um, but like He'll, he can sweep aside his bangs like he sweeps <laughs> aside my concerns <laughs> um but certainly like uh yeah like for you know your generation and like the generation before that there's a bit less information and it's what you were getting at before of just like you know, you sort of think about these things and you find some people that you can trust and talk to, but it, it's, uh, it's a wild west. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, we have to recognize too, that um, coming to terms with your sexuality, right. Is, mm-hmm. you know, in our case, it's very, it's, um, I don't know, it's not polarizing, but very, um, a little bit more clean cut in the sense of like, I am attracted to one other gender. Mm-hmm. And it's my same gender. But there are people who fall in so many other 
parts of this queer spectrum of like yeah like my sexuality doesn't end there it's like i might like men and women i might like people who are non-binary i might be non-binary myself i yeah i like i might be romantically attracted to somebody but sexually sexually attracted to another person i may be asexual Mm -hmm. and so there's like a lot of other layers that people go through that i never had to deal with Mm -hmm. and unfortunately when it comes to sex and sexuality it is one of the most intimate personal scary things you can do in life regardless of the queer content just like Mm -hmm. exploring your body your Mm -hmm. body um that it's like unpacking your meat sandwich (laughs) how many layers of your meat sandwich do you have (laughs) slow down there hoagie um the it's it's like it's innately a vulnerable and scary place to go into, especially when yeah. you're confused about who you are as a person, exactly. let alone around your sexuality, but just in terms of like what you want in life and what you're going to be in terms of career, and, you know, like what you like and what you don't like. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a lot to dive into. Um, yeah. and you're, and it's good. It's good that there is more resources of information, but more resources of information also mean more confusion, right? Cause they can get mm-hmm. more conflicting opinions more bizarre you know double standards or whatever might be out there on the web Um, yeah so it's tough it's really tough exactly Uh, so it's like yeah at the end of the day like you gotta go through it you gotta experiment and like trust your gut and like you know slowly but surely develop an intuition about these kinds of things and this is one quick thing i want to mention um because we were talking about like sexuality being confusing like it's almost intense enough uh for heterosexual couples um because there's like this procreation aspect when mm-hmm. it's uh same sex couples or you know just like non procreating couples um you get into this territory of like i am with this person and we are like intimate with each other and we like enjoy each other and sex is almost all it is is like a form of play and like a form of bonding and like stress relief and like emotional maintenance and like all of these things um but like procreating doesn't even come into it so it's just like i don't even know it's not any more complicated like it's just all complicated (laughs) it's like a very wide range of experiences yeah and i think um i don't don't know i because i can't speak because i'm not coming from that world like i had a bit of it but Mm -hmm. honestly like I, i think i've told you this but basically the first time i had the possibility of having a procreative based relationship so i Mm -hmm. I think i slept with a woman that's what was the actually the catalyst that sent me to like i need to date a man and then i figured Mm -hmm. out okay um but so i don't have a lot of experience in that world but my thought would be is that when you actually remove it right when you're dealing with kind of being queer and exploring uh, relationships that aren't going to procreation isn't a concern of mine um i feel like maybe you have to you you um because there's such a focus especially in sex education about making sure you're safe from yeah. STIs and also preventing a child to coming into a world that you know that they're you are not ready to bring them into mm-hmm. um, that they're probably more concerned and more focused on it and they're more safe about it whereas like where you throw that caution into the wind then uh, you're probably it's almost like you can experiment more with it and you can play around with it more so you're getting exposed to it more I would assume that like if I were more active especially because when i came out i was very active because it's Mm. like i have all these years to make up for i need to fuck 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 (laughs) Mm, (laughs) it's mm, just mm. like you're kind of thrown into it more quickly because you're not how old Hmm? were you if you don't mind my asking i honestly can't remember my exact age i was 22 or 23 is my last year of university and i just can't remember whether or not it was before or after my birthday okay but it was like early 20s yeah gotcha um so yeah if you're kind of experimenting out of space you're not worried about like having a kid then suddenly you're just gonna like i'm gonna do a lot more of this and try it in a lot more ways and so mm-hmm. the more you do it the more you're gonna get th- thrown through the loops um and yeah. and that must be super hard for somebody who is bisexual or otherwise you know like yeah or, or fluid or whatever it's 
like then suddenly it's like oh some of my relationships i'm going to be have to be worried about a kid and other relationships i'm not and, and <laughs> yeah. so it's going to get really confusing for them yeah shout out for bisexual visibility day is when we're recording this uh you are literally seeing... today yeah, yeah yeah uh yeah. it was super recently but yeah oh. if anyone out there is bi or pan or whatever you're valid you don't have to pick sides enjoy your fucking life <laughs> yeah and also we recognize that in the queer community you are put upon I think, yeah. um, because, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's sort of the straddling of the fence, actually, some people that are like, yeah, they take it personally. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, and they're sort of like, pick a side, you know, and it's just like the mm -hmm. queer community can be harsh to others. Yeah, 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 that's a whole other conversation. Maybe we'll revisit it sometime mm -hmm. uh, when we do this again, if we do this again. Um, can we talk about Dragon Ball Z? Yes. <laughs> Bring it up. So, Bring it up. So, Fucking Dragon Ball Z, I'm pretty sure, is responsible for my first boner. Um, Which character was it? Almost, almost 100% certain. It was probably Teen Gohan. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, no, maybe Adult Gohan. I think for me it was... I mean, yeah, yes. yeah, it's a dog. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred, yeah. But I, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also, who is the green guy? He's often fighting Piccolo. Him. Piccolo. I thought Piccolo was hot, dude. Because uh, I think Piccolo also had like young and adult years, didn't he? Because I remember seeing versions of him. Uh, let's see. Well, he was a um. He was <laughs> not not no. That was just crazy. That's like baby one. He's but a. I think there was. He's a certain race of, like creature. I'm not a huge, Dragon Ball fan, but let me see here. He's a. Ne he's from Namek. He's a Namekian. Namekian. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Look at all them. Aww. So, anyway, so. Mm, adult Gohan. I'm just gonna pause recording for a second. I'll be right it's back. Like, <laughs> David just found his sandwich. Mm, look um, at that triple decker. Yeah. Whoa! Oh, oh, it's so high res. Um, That's high so, res. So anyway, so Dragon Ball Z. Uh, there was this weird experience that I had when I was like, I was sort of remembering the show. Um, I was like falling asleep. And I was thinking about them, like, powering up and, like, their muscles getting bigger because that's, like, a very, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, common image in that show. Yeah. And I distinctly remember – this is so embarrassing, but I was, like uh, – <laughs> whenever i feel this like swelling in my pants that means i'm powering up <laughs> um because i didn't i didn't understand what was happening Pant like, I power didn't, up yeah i didn't have a name for it um so uh, there you go moving on next subject <laughs> no we are not moving on denied staying on that i completely understand so th th this is such a um tearing topic for me because oh, yeah. i love anime i love manga i was exposed to so much of it especially throughout university and that became like my launching point for it yeah and i you know for somebody who came from the print world and more north american comics and stuff like that yeah i had a love of um you know like the muscle bound beautifully drawn x-men and you know other marvel comic series and dc stuff mm -hmm. batman was such a turn on for me yeah um, even like the animated series yeah i feel a and, butt coming on right uh <laughs> but and it was like but it was like a static version of that so uh -huh. you then translate that into the anime world into the mm -hmm. japanese version of how they handle animation mm -hmm. and so they take that and push it to the limit mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so it's all about taking that and then suddenly focusing on it and exaggerating it to the nth degree yeah suddenly exaggerating from what? like muscle bound Sorry. wolverine to muscle bound piccolo and gohan uh -huh. but they are spending 5 10 20 minutes entire episodes <laughs> yeah, on yeah. showing their muscles getting bigger <laughs> and bigger and more glistening <laughs> and more shiny yeah. and more yeah. like power uppy and so and that's i think that's why the reason why i like piccolo i'm like obviously he's an alien and he's green and, and i'll yeah. never run into another person like that probably in my lifetime but he still personified that 
per, per picturesque man and so and i got to stare at it and watch it power <laughs> up so i had my pant power ups for sure <laughs> uh, from anime and from comic books and but now the flip side for me is i also really got frustrated by it so I, first i yeah. hated dragon ball z because they would spend half an hour powering up before they did anything and i was just like this is over the top this is too much and it's still a bit of a point of contention with an anime for me where yeah it's beautiful because they have such wonderful metaphors for how to represent intensity and dynamic fights and stuff but there is there is a point where like my more north american mentality comes in and i'm just like get to the point stop doing this you've been shouting at each other for five minutes <laughs> yeah 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 the, i've looked a little bit into that how there seems to be a small cultural difference between like uh, Japanese media and American media where there definitely is a premium in American media on like efficiency and like you know getting to the point and like you know can you tell a tight story in 22 minutes like that's like yeah. the gold standard of of broadcast TV um, yeah. because of ad coverage and like the on the flip side in a, quite a bit of Japanese media there are RPGs and adventure games and um, story-based games and even manga and anime and stuff that are almost notorious for how much filler there is. And yeah. there's this, like, there's almost this divide. It's not even a cultural divide. I think it's just, like, a personal preference of how much people want to feel like they're grinding um versus feel like they are getting something like fresh out of every yeah. time they like visit the thing and yeah. there are people who genuinely enjoy grinding because it's such a simple thing and it's Mindless. like you can just like relax you don't have yeah. to like invest yourself in it while people who want that more like fast-paced content whether it's yeah. a game or a piece of um like story media um you know, you very often do have to pay attention because like every page counts, every minute counts, you know? Um, yeah. So that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> that was beautiful. And it makes so much sense because I, I am of the, let me know I'm getting where somewhere for type, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a grinder. I hate grinding. Um, <laughs> I sure you I, do. I, well, I ground my teeth so much that I had to get a guard at night. <laughs> That's how much I hate grinding. <laughs> uh, but I love grinder. Um, <laughs> the yeah, the the aspect of to me it is about like I, I love the narrative arc, but it is an arc and it has a beginning, a rise, a peak and then a denouement and it mm -hmm. plateaus again at the other side mm -hmm. because to me it is something that establishes something it builds up it builds up it eventually comes down to the other side and it concludes and that's yeah. why i love rpgs and i love narratives and i love narrative arcs but if that narrative arc continues to arc for day after day minute mm -hmm. after minute you know like episode after episode then i'm just like that's where i get to, it gets too much for me that's where like my north american mentality of give me a tight story comes in because mm -hmm. i don't want to see that arc continually going up i don't want to keep going uphill uh eventually i get tired eventually i'm just like this is too much and that's why like i did struggle with things like anime and that because i was just like they've been powering up for a whole episode <laughs> like yep. i want to see them shoot that thing and usually when they do it it's so epic and it's so cool then i'm just like oh that's yep. that's me coming after <laughs> like yeah, finally exactly. i get the payoff right <laughs> um so i don't want to see too to much about art. that okay uh regarding like payoff because i think that's the other thing too that's between this like to grind or not to grind like <laughs> yeah. dilemma is like Someone who really likes grinding, they might say that it's more rewarding to them to really put all that time in because mm -hmm. they genuinely invested all of that time literally out of their life, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's this like flip side to that where it's like, well, how much does a person really gain from a media experience? By it taking a super long time. Oh it's my god! Just you get a, a whole media experience. episode on that, David. Write it down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Write it down. Because oh like, oh my gosh, 
yeah, that's, oh, geez, that's sort of right what right. I've been thinking about a lot, too. Like, I'm at a point right now where, like, I've always gone back and forth about how much I really need to see something or I really need to play a game mm-hmm. or watch a show, watch a movie. Um, and I'm getting much more to a point now where, like, I am caring less and less, where I'm like, if it comes across uh, to me, that's great. Like, I will look for stuff to watch or consume if I want to. Um, Or if someone I really trust uh, recommends something to me, I'll take that recommendation. But I'm not in this place of, like, hunger where, like, I need answers from media, you know? And I wonder sometimes... Expand on that. What do you mean? Like... I think a lot of how I approached stories in the past was this sense of like, I, I need to know what happens. I want to be able to talk about this and just like, you know, just like rush, 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 skip to the end. So I can just say that I've seen it. And now I'm like a well-informed person. It was like the totality of it. Yeah. It was just, I wanted the bare bones information of whatever the thing was. Um, and what that would do is sort of like pull me out of the experience. Um, So I don't know. I've thought about this a lot over the years and I'm definitely Mm -hmm. at this point where I'm much more leaning on the like moment to moment enjoyment side and a little less the side of like, well, if it's a slog, maybe it'll be worth it later on. Um, Yeah. I have maybe Mm -hmm. like two or three hours of slog in me at this point uh, before I put stuff down. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. And Mm -hmm. I, so, again, write this down. We're, we're doing a thing <laughs> on this because I think it's a very meaty topic and I don't want to dive yeah. too deep on it. But yeah, I yeah. think that it is true that um, I, I'm, in, I'm in a space similar to you. It, I, and I think it partly comes from age. You know, you have less attention mm-hmm. span uh, because you have more going on in your life. And mm-hmm. I think it's also partly from being part of the internet generation. And I'm like, I'm like the half and half. You're like, you're almost, almost into a generation that didn't experience life without the internet, yeah. um, where I have less attention span because I also have so many different media choices and things I can do and so much going on. So between responsibility and then this general media consumption, um, I want more payoff and I want more balance. I want, I want a, um, but I and I but I'm not so much so to the extent where I'm like I'm just like give me like five minutes of everything and I'm just like bam after bam after bam I'm like I want another story mm-hmm. and another character and another thing I'm like I'm not that I'm like I yeah. want a balance I yeah. am more zen about it I want a balance of like I want to get into that narrative I want to see it grow I want to see some challenge I want to see some change of the character and some like you know overcoming and lessons yeah. learned and then it wrap and end. And a perfect example for me is that, and I find challenge in this, is that I, I got into like things like World of Warcraft, like MMOs and that, mm-hmm. um, because I loved Warcraft and I loved RPG games. And I loved narrative-based games and fantasy yeah. because they had this great narrative arc. And so I wanted to get into it, but eventually I got so pissed off with it because it wouldn't end. It would like exactly. they're innately designed never to end. And I'm not a grinder. I hated grinding. I wanted to see it end eventually. And the only thing that really kept me in those worlds were the social aspect. I actually have friends to this day still from people I met in that game. Yeah. And so like I, I want to be able to get lost in a story. I want to feel you know lost and connected and feeling these characters and that and i want to give enough time to build that and learn that but it definitely needs to end it definitely needs to eventually end and not get drawn out over multiple seasons or multiple you know like power up sessions you know like that's that's where i started getting frustrated and what's interesting is that this a perfect example for this for me again they were going into the film and tv world um that's why i really appreciate british narrative like a lot mm-hmm. of British TV series are built around a narrative that begin, middle, and done. They've written yeah. it ahead of time and it ends and it's so good. Whereas a lot of North American stuff, uh, as much as they're like all about like, you know, they say that they're all about narrative and it's like it's important to them. But there's so many TV series in that they're like, you're, you're sure they started off pitching. They're like, I got this idea for like these two kids and they're living in New York and they're having troubles. And, uh, you know, one of them gets fired and the other one hires them. But... I don't know where it's going to go, but if it does well, it does well. And so then, they, you know, they run it and they run it for a season. And they're like, this is doing well. And then they stretch it the fuck out for like 
as oh, many yeah. seasons as they can before eventually people are just like, I'm, now I'm bored of this. So they're losing money. And so they, they never really had a narrative arc intention. They just had an idea to spark. Yeah, yeah. It is nice because at the very least, because there's so much choice and there is so much content these days, um, you know, people can in many ways look for um, the exact kind of thing that they want, wherever their preference lies in how efficient they want versus how grindy they want <laughs> their like, yeah. media to feel, which is, again, like narrative based or like video games as well. Um, yeah. So let's. There's a, there's uh, a thing for everybody, right? A, a market for every taste. Exactly. And so it'll, it's just interesting watching how it changes and how like niches are becoming the norm as opposed to giant studios and giant productions, you know? Mm hmm. Um, yeah. So let's sort of hammer home some of these last little uh, tidbits, and then we're probably going to uh, wrap it up. Did we cover video game stuff? I think we did, didn't we? Uh, I guess sort No, of. we touched on video games with Game Informer, but yeah. we can definitely... Let's circle back to video if, games. If you want to. I yeah. mean, a lot of this, I think, all kind of adds up to it. Exactly. Um, I mean, this, this, the, my thing, my thing that I was going to bring to this was about, like, RPG games and fighter games. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting How about is that? that, like... RPGs, for me, were the narrative piece, right? I got to mm -hmm. see the, and I say this almost extends from the print media. So mm -hmm. the, oh, yes, yeah, Final Fantasy. The <laughs> love of fantasy, the love of narrative, the love of, you know, overt, sexualized, and not, and it's, what's okay, so there's another interesting point I need to bring about this, a specific to Final Fantasy and to yeah. Japanese media. Yeah. Uh, so some of them are just very built. Some of them are really beautiful. But there's almost always this consistent element of feminist, uh, not feminist, uh, but feminine qualities and yeah. feminized male characters and stuff like that that I always found very intriguing because I think as a budding gay, I am totally comfortable with my feminine end of the spectrum and playing in that space. And it doesn't bother me. Like, I consider myself overall masculine, but I'm like, I know that I am the whole spectrum. I mm -hmm. have feminine in me and masculine in me and so i was always very intrigued and always loved that in things like final fantasy we're like looking at right now looking at cloud with his giant s sword which i think was a big metaphor for his penis and mm -hmm. i love that <laughs> mm -hmm. but um a big metaphor it, <laughs> put two pieces of bread on that thing we got a whole thing um we you know like i could see that and i got all those elements i wanted in one I got the fantasy, I got the narrative, I got the like muscle bound, beautiful looking people, but I also got the feminine quality because they were like, um, they were okay with it and they're comfortable with it, exploring that. And I knew that that was mm -hmm. part of who I was growing up, you mm -hmm. know, that I knew I liked being flamboyant or vulnerable or uh, feminine or genteel yeah. or expressive. And I think the Japanese culture in a weird way as much as they have trouble with homosexuality as a subject they're okay with feminism mm -hmm. i say feminism i think of like the topic but more like feminine yeah well what you're talking and... about is the bishonen is what it's called I've um never heard of that yeah that. it's the word for beautiful boy and it's a whole mm -hmm. genre of stories of like character design and all of this stuff and the more like thin uh pretty boy uh well-kept smooth-faced like that whole yeah. genre of males like the metrosexual of japan exactly um mm -hmm. and i was listening to a podcast called lemon i think i mentioned it to you earlier mm -hmm. where they were talking about um they were talking about k-pop idols and like what is going on with the like metrosexuality of k-pop uh males specifically mm -hmm. um because very often again like you can sort of look at them and be like this is clearly like for gay male appreciation but it's also like for women's appreciation yeah. um and Supposedly, what they brought up one of the biggest readers of gay narrative uh, manga in mm -hmm. japan are women so yeah. a lot of women who read about gay male relationships exactly because i mean it's the just the classic like whatever like porn or like sexuality thing of like well i'm attracted to this gender so i'm gonna look at erotic stories of just this gender you know yeah, yeah. Um, because the women really like that look of a guy out yeah. there right and in, in the korean and japanese cultures yeah i like that look of a guy i'll say it mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and the point that they brought up in lemon about uh these k-pop men and how they like how just beautiful they are 
it, and how they'll wear make they'll wear makeup as well. Um, it's like why why do they wear makeup? And it's almost around this idea of like purity and being like a beautiful flower in many ways. Um, and just like I don't know I don't know where to even go with that. <laughs> just like yeah, just like a young beautiful. Uh, flower guy. yeah it's just like a young beautiful <laughs> flower but there is yeah. something about this like purity aesthetic that um that yeah uh you know eastern media like seems to explore with like their pretty men while a lot of yeah. western media um doesn't doesn't really have like pretty boys as much no. they might be coming up a little more now but yeah, yeah, definitely not in like superhero comics and like no. all these it things. It was much more hyper masculinized as opposed to yeah. hyper feminized, right? Yeah. Um, you, that's why you had X Men. That's why like my first like foray into that stuff was like large, beefy, um, you know, dark haired, bearded, hairy. Like I think that comes from much more of the Western culture and mm -hmm. the Western upbringing and the Western um, aesthetic and yeah. what we're exposed to. But in the East, uh, it was, it's, they, I think they still appreciate that to some, uh, yeah, like for if sure. you, you look up Bara, it's a Japanese. Oh, I know so, about Bara. <laughs> you know about Bara? Okay. So when I was in Japan, I went and found like Bara books and, uh, <laughs> we're getting a bunch of ja gypsy women. I don't know about it. Yeah. See, Bara is like, it's masculinized and beefy and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, like, look, they have like, okay, there's like images of like beefy cat people. So they're like legitimately full fur, right? <laughs> so uh -huh. um, that that's a thing. That's so it's still, still within the culture, but I think they have a much more of appreciation. I think that was one of the books I actually looked at once. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, the, I think there is more of um, an appreciation for the feminine qualities because they innately, it comes from aspects of their culture, right? Um, mm -hmm. Japan has flower arrangement and kabuki theater, and they have a lot of really dainty, beautiful architecture and design. And yeah. um, they innately, as a people, have more uh, feminine elements to their. <laughs> That's really interesting. I love that. <laughs> um, but you'll you know they'll have like they're more slight, um, thinner framed, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. feminine features in that, and. Um, a thing that was such a big like learning lesson for me in life was that to be a man does not mean to be masculine. Yeah, yeah. And to be a female does not mean to be feminine. You can be female in gender, but you can be the full spectrum of gender expression. So, mm -hmm. so it's just like the um, you can just be as just as much of a man and have feminine qualities or masculine qualities. And so I think in the Eastern culture, they're much more embrace that and it's become innately, it's innately part of like their culture. So it then goes into their media. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I have some feelings about like, uh, cause I've talked to some Asian men recently about like, uh, how there is this sort of perception, uh, in the West of like, yeah, just like Asian men, like not being as masculine, like whatever that means. Um, yeah. And it can definitely be a problem. And there's this story of um, how Bruce Lee was portrayed in how to, what's it called? The Hollywood movie? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh. There's a moment where a sort of Bruce Lee impersonator um, makes like a cameo in the movie. And... In that scene, basically, Brad Pitt beats the shit out of the Bruce Lee because mm. he was being, like, arrogant and, like, trying to start shit in the Hollywood lot and all of this stuff. And what Tarantino says is Bruce Lee, or people that he talked to within the industry, said that Bruce Lee came across as arrogant, as, um, you know, wanting to start fights, like, wanting to prove himself and, like, not taking shit from other people on set, while what it is possible had happened was these men within Hollywood encountered a, um, a Chinese man. I believe Bruce Lee is Chinese, right? Bruce Lee? I don't know. Uh, do, 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 do. Chinese. Yeah. Chinese Hong Kong. Um, he, uh, how, what maybe happened was 
these American, you know, actors and crew member and all of this stuff, they encountered a Chinese man with confidence and like who was asserting himself. Mm. And because of weird racial biases that were happening in the like 60s, 70s, they interpreted that as him being too aggressive, like too assertive, like too uh, whatever, just like out there um, because of him bumping up against their like preconceptions, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and then it gets distorted they're... when the story gets retold by more Americans <laughs> in yeah. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know? And, and, that's, and by that's the way, cool. The Bruce Lee estate, like, they did not sign off on that representation either. Ooh. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Legal implications. Yeah. So anyway, um, we're definitely getting in the weeds. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. But I, I, think that's, I think that's very true. I think that's a general issue of human issue of mm -hmm. when we have preconceptions that are challenged, that's where we get our backs up because we get afraid of what what we expect versus what the reality is and so they probably face that in the bruce lee scenario and it's the reason why like in order for anyone to grow and change you need to be willing to unlearn and relearn uh, one of my yeah. favorite um quotes i learned back in university when i was like studying design and that was um, by alvin toffler that the illiterate of the 21st century is not those who cannot read um or write but those who can't learn unlearn and relearn so you have to face those moments of altercation with your preconceptions. And if you can't unlearn them and relearn them and realize that, hey, a Bruce Lee can be just as masculine and be an Eastern based person with Eastern based features and cultural upbringing and mannerisms mm -hmm. and whatever, and still be just as masculine as any other person around this globe, um, yep. then, then you've got trouble if you can't, if you can't provide yourself that opportunity to relearn that and redefine what masculine is. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a learning lesson. I think that is constantly going because man, I, uh, um, you know, that's something I learned. Like I found throughout life, you know, like my, my default, I think kind of guy was based off of the media I was raised off of. And so it was more of the classically like built, gruff, aggressive, um, man. But I realized through life that I'm actually what I prefer, actually somebody who straddles the middle. Mm -hmm. I prefer a person who has masculine qualities, but is perfectly happy being feminine and are, you know, uh, flamboyant and expressive and gentle and soft and, you know, everything on the other side of the feminine spectrum. Somebody who's willing to play in both sides is mm -hmm. so much more attractive to me than somebody who is completely on one side or the other. Totally. Um, can we close talking about Sonic the Hedgehog? Yes. <laughs> Sonic dee, the Hedgehog dee, 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 dee. was my first experience drawing porn for myself literally yeah 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 yeah. i didn't do it with like humanoid yeah, characters <laughs> i did it with no so what i did was actually there was let me bring it up um there was this thing on the nintendo ds called picto chat I that remember this. was basically you just sort of like you could write little text messages to each other or you could draw in this little um like drawing window and yeah. what would happen is your drawings would sort of pop up into the top screen and they would just go one after another. So what you could do is you could draw sort of like the top, um, you could draw like the head of a picture. Then you could draw the like neck, shoulders and like upper bust. Then you I'm could a... like draw like the lower section. And because of the shape of the DS, it would sometimes be like, you know, you have little like barriers built into your drawing. Um, yeah. So it's like you're drawing into a window or something. And so I would use that because there would be no record <laughs> of the drawings I was making. <laughs> so it was like this temporary, like etch a sketch gone digital. Exactly. Because like, oh my gosh. if I, um, if I did it on a computer, I would be using like a trackpad and mouse um, and I couldn't draw as well just using that method. I didn't have a tablet. I wasn't going to scan something because then there would be a record. Um, oh, well, with gosh. this, you had the little stylus, the little touch You're screen. You're so secretive. So you oh, no wonder you used DuckDuckGo. Duck, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just full of, <laughs> full of secrets. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was my uh, 
my first experience drawing erotica, which I have picked up a little bit more again recently. Um, so would because, somebody send you like yeah. the top half of Sonic and you draw him with like genitalia on the other half? This was only local communication. So okay. it would only show up uh, if there were other people in your vicinity. So all I would do would just be like, just up late at night, no one else had a Nintendo DS and I would just like go into one of these rooms and I would just sort of draw. It was like a sketchbook by myself. <laughs> But you, it was by yourself. You weren't with, yeah. like, communicating with anyone else. Yeah, it was just Picto. There was no chat. <laughs> okay. That would have been so interesting if it was, like, that would be, like, the nerdy, like, gay chat room, you know, for artists. You know? <laughs> you yeah, try totally. to go into a room, find somebody, they're like, here's Sonic, finish it for me. And then you just mm -hmm. do dirty Sonic stuff on the bottom and then you send it, it back and forth. Exactly. Once I got a little bit older, like three or four years after this scenario, I started realizing there were things like, um, I can't remember what it was called at the time, but there's a site called DrawPile, which is server-based um, drawing where you just sort of get into a pseudo like chat room and you just share a canvas and people can draw whatever they feel like wherever you know mm. wow uh oh my gosh um so so that was your sonic queer like very literal queer exploration yeah exactly um, my relationship to sonic was <laughs> definitely not <laughs> I think it was, it was like abstracted from a human form. I never had much of like any kind of like queer awakenings or connections there. It mm -hmm. was more, I think it was just more generally video games and it was part of the parcel of video games. But I, Sonic to me, I remember it was one of the first games, I think it was Sonic 2, getting on mm -hmm. the Sega Genesis and being mind blown by the graphics and mm -hmm. the perspectives of being able to like go up and down over like um what should we call them uh, like the tubes or whatever like the little running yeah. paths you would go down and be like getting like the closest thing you could get to like a uh, uh, vertigo uh watching my screen be mm -hmm. like whoa <laughs> like you're going yeah, exactly. up and it's like this is so wild and now yeah. i like look back on it as like oh this is nothing <laughs> um it was very mind-boggling and very eye-opening in terms of uh yeah kind of like like how video games could go into these whole new dimensions and explore new things and i think a lot of that later informed some of the like other games you playing with perspective mm -hmm. and even the resurgence like more modern throwback to that stuff was things like oh, i'm forgetting the game now but it was like this little white um doughy character and his the whole thing was about going around corners and stuff and it was all like a 3d mm -hmm. environment um, yeah um fez fez thank you so fez yeah. and i would play that and so and i think that was a lot of a nod to that whole world of sonic perspective and distortion of perspective same mm -hmm. with like super mario world 2 i think it was and you would go inside of like little doors would pop up and you'd go inside of it and the like screen would like kind of would translate a bit and you would like mm -hmm. you'd move and you'd end up inside of a pipe or inside of another world it was like the world behind the world and gotcha. so like playing with all yeah. that perspective stuff and and that was kind of like a lot of my real exploration of the sonic world the um yeah the the i i i just i'm just thinking like <laughs> the only can i just say too of, like sonic uh, for whatever reason is one of the most popular porn categories on the internet full stop um i is this I a have, current thing or an old thing current thing for whatever reason there's just something about sonic and like the furry community and oh, that whole thing oh yeah where people yeah. like latch on to this character and discover in themselves some sort of appreciation for uh I don't even know what to call it without being offensive of just like their more animal like side of their sexuality or whatever. Oh yeah. And on top of that, like the furry community that like is not sexual, but it's just like a friendship type thing. I don't know enough about that community. I can't, I can't speak on it. And maybe one yeah. day I will have my preconceptions challenged. <laughs> yes, and then we'll have to unlearn and relearn because <laughs> I don't know much about it. Like, I know of the existence of the furry community. I've looked it up out of, like, sick interest in that, and mm -hmm. I've looked into the subject matter I mean, a you didn't bit, have but, like, to label it sick. 
<laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for calling me out. Yes, yes, I know. It, it's it's the my sick interest in it as in like looking into something taboo that I wouldn't mm -hmm. or I consider taboo. Um, I there it's interesting like. I totally looked up some of that stuff and I looked up like furry and I looked up furry sex and I looked up like furry like uh, animated porn and stuff and yeah. um, I my very first porn I bought was an animated porn uh, animated gay porn but it was like it was humans um, mm -hmm. but I definitely had an interest in that and it's funny as like yeah. the stuff I'd always look for if ever I looked into that stuff would be is like it would be a furry that was anthropomorphized Right. Oh it was yeah. Like oh my god. I wolf. had a bunch of those as well. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, it was never be like just like a a, a wolf that stand you know went bipedal. It was like a wolf that looks like a human. You know, like yeah. I always wanted that human element because that's just my thing. And you know, everyone has their kinks. Go for it. Love you know furries. Have more fun. Do your thing. Yiff all you want. But it's um. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, we it need was, to do it, an episode strictly on um internet games and like flash games and new grounds because i wanted to talk about that but i think sure. we're out of time we need again we need to like pull them up and like play them a little bit and be like <laughs> i forgot about this yeah if they still exist i mean maybe because i mean i know yeah, that chrome keeps reminding me that it's turning off flash at the end of this year so exactly exactly yeah soon. time's running out and like there's no way to yeah, what do you even do with it? Because you can't show that content on YouTube, number one. It could be audio only and then just like a blurry screen <laughs> as yeah. we describe what's happening. Well, we could blend it in with like some other uh, more yeah. modern we'll equivalents of We'll just put National like... Geographic footage over <laughs> these wild games. I downloaded and played through one full narrative of... Uh, what was it called? Like Dating Daddy? No. Um... Dream Daddy. Dream Daddy. Yeah, yeah, you've told me about it. Yeah, and so there's modern versions of that. It, the subject matter is not dead. It is just changed. Exactly. The subject matter is not dead. It's just changed. <laughs> Ooh, and that's, that's our that's quote. our motto <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> here at whatever this show is. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, uh, do you have any uh, do you have any other quote that you want to share? In closing, I'll see if I can find one real quick. I'll um, just look on my phone. I don't know if I have a quote. I would just say, like, the, the lesson I have learned from this discu discussion, and I think should be true of anyone who is exploring their queer self at a young age and trying to figure out who they are, especially if they fall into the category of the artistic, the theatrical, the nerdy. It's like, keep this stuff alive keep exploring this and go through this and and look in this and love it and nerd it up and and fantasy it up do your thing because you're going to not only discover more about yourself but you're going to and not just like sexually but you're going to discover where your interests lie and what what makes you who you are so i'm, I'm glad that there's new you know like like take that quote and and be like i'm glad the content's not dead it's just changed into new format so it's, mm -hmm. it's just going to keep evolving and it'll be interesting to see where it goes and let all the youth have exposure to it and explore it totally in a safe and consensual way yeah in in so many words it sounds like you said you can't be what you can't see oh <laughs> quote number two <laughs> um this is super fun uh if y'all want to subscribe to the youtube channel this is on please do that um leave a like maybe share it with a friend if you found the conversation interesting let us know in the comments uh, what media you were watching as a young queer person or even a young straight person that was like a bizarre sort of awakening of attraction and like curiosity in yourself because that's so interesting and why we spent so long talking about it. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna stop recording. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.